Welcome, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Essence of Overlanding. And it really is just a fireside chat for us to share experiences, knowledge, insights, advice, based on our different experiences of overlanding to inspire other women. We know it's a pretty, or well, historically, it's been a pretty male dominant form of adventure travel. And we want to inspire other people to have the courage, face their fears, and really do they need to be as fearful? And is it as daunting? And by the time we're done, I think we could get many more women overlanders. So Karen, can I start with you? Because you are our earliest overlander in our history. And my favorite memory is when I met you for the first time and you came down on your own. It wasn't your first time in overlanding, but something started you in overlanding. So can you share your story of how you started in overlanding that led you to get a truck and then you came down to Cape Town and you took delivery of the truck on your own and you were learning about overlanding on the road with Paul and I. Yeah, so it was a really fun trip with you guys. So, um, no, it was a great start to overlanding. I mean, we've been coming to Africa on, on holiday, um, kind of doing the usual safari trips that you do if you if you're coming from Europe and you kind of explore. But we kind of always felt there's so much more to it, and there's so much that you miss because you kind of land somewhere at a main airport, you fly into a national park, and then. You know, it's beautiful and everything else, but you miss so much. So then we kind of started thinking, how can we explore more of that? Um, how do you do that? And of course, the best way is if you just drive yourself and you just, yeah, you can stop where you want, you can look at what you want and you see what you want. So. And so when you took that first, that leap of faith and you got your truck, you then didn't have Chris coming with you to Cape Town. You did it all on your own as a woman, and you had to learn on the drive, so to speak. Tell us a little bit about that, starting when you met your truck in Cape Town. <laughs> yeah, so it was, I mean, I was super excited because we'd been building the truck with, with Paul kind of over months, but over the phone and over WhatsApp and over video, I don't know. So I was really excited to see it, but it was a bit daunting as well to think, my goodness, now I'm going to drive and then we're going to, we're going to cross borders and, you know, what happens if something goes wrong and everything else. So it was that part as well. Um, I think I probably worried too much um, because actually, well, it did help to go, of course, with people who had more experience than me. So going with you guys to start off with was helpful because... I got to know the truck a bit better, of course, with Paul, and um, I didn't have to cross the first borders on my own, but I think by the fourth border or so on, then I headed off on my own, and it was just fine. And, um, yeah, it's, it's actually not that hard. And your subsequent trips on your own with Chris, how's that played out? Because now you had to teach him what you had learned. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That was, that was a fun part, I must say, though. No, um, <laughs> It's, I think, yeah, it's given us a lot more confidence just to say, you know, I mean, because we take short trips at the moment, we still plan a bit more ahead because if you only have two or three weeks, of course, you have to know where you're going to end up and how much time you have. We'd love to go for longer and then just, you know, go with the flow. But um, so I think it does help us that we plan a bit because now we know what to expect, but um, only within reason so that you still have the flexibility of the overlapping, of course. Right. So to that point about planning and preparing, Tina, can can you come in with some of your stories? Because you've got an incredible story where you had your truck built in the UK. Tell us where you started in overlanding and how that all unfolded, that you then went from London to Cape Town and west coast of Africa, which is really the road less traveled. <laughs> Yes, that's right. Thanks, Joe, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you here. It's brilliant. And and um, so like you said, yes, we had our uh, car built in London, or we were based in London, and we had our car built um, by Paul whilst he had his business um, in the UK. Uh, so we were quite lucky to find him. And um, in terms of preparation to the trip, or maybe the planning of the trip was that um, Anton, my partner and I lived in London at the time and decided to relocate to Cape Town. And we thought, well, 
flying is a bit boring, why not just drive? <laughs> and, and it has um, always been a dream of Anton to do that uh, trip. And I was very excited and happy to um, do more overlanding. I had only w done one trip before in um, uh, in Namibia, Botswana, with a, a school friend of mine at the time. Um, so I was very keen to do a bit more extreme versions of a, you know, three week Namibia, Botswana travel. And um, so we luckily ended up with Paul, who was just the best person to obviously prepare us uh, for the trip. So we had um, actually a couple of good sessions with him um, uh, in Peterborough, where he was based at the time. And he prepared us, um, I think, just with a lot of practical tips and talked us through border crossings and how to, you know, what, what might be possible to experience and, and expect and just general safety measures. And I think what really helped us was listening to his stories as well. And, 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 and that's, I think, what we are doing here now as well. If you, if you tell your stories, other people can learn from it. And, and, and I think that's what we did. Paul told us a lot of his own experiences, stories, and we remembered them, you know, during the trip. Um, and so we, we were lucky enough to, to take six months um, wow. at a time to do this journey. So we were on the road for about five and a half months, I think. Um, and that was long for me. I, I could really feel at the end I was ready to, <laughs> you know, to, um, to have some creature com comforts around me again. Um, what was difficult think, about the five yeah. months? What, what were the, the things that stood out for you that were difficult? Oh, I think, I mean, it's very clear. It's uh, uh, hygiene is definitely one that stands out, right? And I definitely hit a couple of my limits and, and um, it, is, it is challenging. And often for women, it's more challenging than for men. Um, and, um, but, but you get around it, but it is a, it is a journey, right? So um, I, one small story I can tell is maybe you know, you need to go to the toilet as a woman. And I say to him, I'll oh, just pull over at the next spot so I can have a pee. So he stops. But I said, well, I can't pee here. He said, yeah, there's a tree. So I said, well, as a man, you can pee here. But as a woman, I need a bit more of a 3D shelter, right, <laughs> on the open road. So, so these are these small things you need to to figure out, right, especially if you're, it's, you know, if you're traveling with a man and a woman together and, and they're just different levels of you know needs i guess needs and understanding of those needs absolutely but you learn a lot you, you know on the road you learn those things and it is also quite funny actually especially in hindsight <laughs> yeah in hindsight it's even more so <laughs> Um, I think what I want to learn in, in, with regards to planning so I think this is actually an important bit and um, I, I do like to plan in general um, I think it was a you know, I'm German. I like to be prepared <laughs> for my set of rules. Um, and where Anton managed to immediately shift into, you know, we are in the adventure mode and didn't plan necessarily, where I struggled, I'm not kidding, for at least two or three months with that my plan of the day doesn't mm. work out. And I found that quite difficult because it is a giving up of control in a way um, and so that is that is something I definitely learned um, for myself on the trip that you can't control over landing you can't um, mm. predict what's going to happen like you look on the map and say okay I'm going to travel today from A to B I'm guessing that might take us five hours but actually it took us probably three days in the end because <laughs> the bridge was broken or the ferry you know, wasn't the working. Exist anymore. Yeah, you know, all these things. And I initially it put a lot of stress. It stressed me if, if we didn't mm -hmm. manage to meet the plan I had for the day. Um, and, and I found it quite difficult not to know where I'm going to sleep at night. Um, that is a security mm -hmm. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can say, yeah, I'm going to sleep in that town, but if you're never going to make it there, and then it, it, you know, it, it, it raises more questions. So those were the things I learned. Like you can't control, you have to give up control. And it took me, I think, two and a half to three months to actually let go. And that was a very liberating experience. And I think then I could enjoy the trip much more. But it was a hard road. It was a hard road to get to that point, I have to say. So what you're saying is actually 
the, the the journey of of the truck and the trip and the destination all of that is one thing but you start to learn a lot about yourself in the process absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely yeah absolutely and something you wouldn't expect like you know when we started the trip we also had these ideas of what would you want to get out of the trip you know apart from just traveling obviously you know you, everyone has their own personal little goals i'm assuming you you were the same down and carrying and oh. when you went on this um but actually what you learn and it might even be bigger than than any of the other hopes and dreams is something you never for was could foresee that just happened um and you didn't even know that is something you wanted to learn or needed to learn and, and that <laughs> then <laughs> that is the bigger, well, it's, bigger it's change. interesting Tina when you talk about the like having a set planning a set route mm. um, my partner who I travel with I always tease her that she's never really quite up to speed as to where we're off to so it's all a bit of a surprise despite the fact that there are excel spreadsheets and we have all kinds of things <laughs> um, it kind of only discovers the morning of um, but if you try and deviate on the day, it's a problem. It's a big mm. problem. So, yeah, that's something that we've had to kind of work through is, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out or you'd have, you'd have a place highlighted because you've read other trip reports and people have said it was amazing. And then you get there and you go, well, mm, not in my book. Right. Um, and also travel times. I mean, we... We found it now with the Land Cruiser on this last trip. Everything takes much longer <laughs> to reach your destination. So we had to kind of, yeah, recalibrate travel times. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, because all of you are, are, have, have spoken in different ways around preparation and planning. And if you could give other women advice around preparation planning what would you say because there's some things you can't plan for mm -hmm. and how you how do you deal with that how do you deal with the things you can't plan for what would you advise people who are anxious or nervous or need the control to know where they're going to find something or if i can't get this at the shops then then what yeah, but I think you've got to, I mean, I think that's half the half the fun, really, sometimes when things are uncomfortable or they don't work out, because <laughs> that's what makes it interesting. Otherwise, it would be a bit dull. Um, but absolutely do your homework. I mean, that, things like, mm -hmm. you know, where you're going to stay or, you know, note down a bit of, you know, some options vaguely. So you've got some idea of what might work if you can't, or even if you don't write it down, have an idea in your head that there is a fallback solution somewhere. And I think that you just pick up by, by reading ahead of time, really. And how have you found reading a lot of information? Because there is, there's forums and everybody's got an opinion and people have got advice. And sometimes it's not always dare I say accurate or it's not something you can relate to? So well, I think you've got to learn to filter, filter it. Yeah, so how do you yeah. filter it? What, um, what would I you think it depends how recent it is. Like it needs to be a yeah. recent um, blog on something. Like, you know, it doesn't help if uh, somebody had been in that area six months ago. That is way too long, you know. Things right. might have changed by then. Yeah. So it needs to be very, very recent. And often what also helps is talk to people who come the other direction or you meet them at a the mm -hmm. camp and they've, you know, they've been there before or they've yeah. heard that. I think that's better than reading on forums. Um because they're often outdated. I, I, well, that's what we found. Maybe, maybe that has changed. It's been like 10 years. And, and how and do also you, find you find like trip reports or travel blogs or kind of read them and, and see if you're sort of simpatico with that person? Because there may be, sometimes I judge by their, their reviews or reports on places that I've been to. And I think... Yeah, I kind of agree with that. They kind of roll the same way we roll. Because everyone has different expectations as to what is good or bad or indifferent. 
So how? It, so, sorry. Carry on, Tina. Go. And can I just go back to your point is with regards to um, you know when when people are a bit worried about you know not having access to certain things or how to cater for something. I I, I think what what is one thing um, what we also did is rather over cater a bit when you plan and pack. Like, I'm not meaning like you're going to pack five suitcases, right? But um, like, make sure you pack enough of stuff for worst case scenarios as well. Yes. Like, don't hold back on taking up whatever, pay medication or plasters or, you know, we even right. took like, you know, certain medical equipment, which I, I also thought, gosh, the chances of us using them is like, you know, 1%, but take it. And then that might feel, make you feel a bit more secure or right. Paul also sorted us out with all the um, spare parts for, for the car, mm -hmm. because obviously if you travel for six months through West Africa, you don't get the parts. We had like the whole roof um, rooftop box, I think was full with um, spare car uh, parts. Like we had so many water pumps and um, oil pumps and filters and whatever. And, and it was like, well, we, we, we only needed half of it. And at the end, when we get, got to Cape Town, we, we had like so much stuff left over. But at least that portion of stress was removed. So we didn't have to worry about that. So, you know, plan that you don't have to worry about certain things. And then the other stuff is, is not, not a lot, actually. It's the peace of mind stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and then it's very comforting. Yeah, and rather take another jersey or another pair of shoes if you're worried about something breaks and you can't get it or whatever, you know. <laughs> and a you can always fit it in place. somewhere. But. <laughs> 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 but I found as well for us, I think just because we're so used to it in everyday life is being able to communicate to the rest of the world. So actually that gave me a lot of comfort, you know, you know even if I never used the sat phone, but I know if I needed to, I can always call for help, yes. but I don't know. Yeah, we didn't really use it a lot yet, but agree. Yeah, it just gives comfort. <laughs> yeah, I agree. But Karen, mm. to your point, it's about making sure that you, your, your family are feeling at ease with your travel because mm. sometimes families think that overlanders are crazy people who are going out into the deepest dark Africa and something's going to happen to you. So it gives them peace of mind so that you don't have them anxious, which makes you anxious. Mm -hmm. And in terms of local knowledge and, and, and getting information on the ground from locals, and did, have you found locals helpful, Karen? Um, you crossed borders, you were worried about them, and then you, you left us in Malawi and you carried the rest of the way on your own to Tanzania. Yes. Tell us about that. No, it's true. I think everybody, is, if, if you ask for help or if you need something, I felt everybody was usually very helpful and just open to, to at least trying to figure it out. I think what I realized also traveling on my own, I was actually more likely to meet other people or start talking to other people than if you're traveling already with other people, because of course you're more open to it as well. So um, I think... Yeah, I think it was super helpful. And actually, in the end, when I stayed in one place, there were these two guys who needed a ride somewhere who were staying at the same place. And I actually gave them a ride in the car the next day for like a few hours. And originally, I would have thought, my goodness, why would that, you know, that's crazy. Just, I didn't even know them. But yeah, it's just, um, I think you realize that you just help each other out and you carry on. And, and 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 Dana, what 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 war stories have you got from some of your? Um... All sound terribly tame in comparison. <laughs> oh, no. So tell you us know, how. You know, it's funny when you you dropped a line saying, "Well, what what were the challenges?" Because um, you've just I think the challenge. challenges is is probably trying not to murder each other occasionally. Yes. Um, <laughs> Because in a relationship you're now thrown together and that it is super intensified. Mm. So anything that's a bit of a touch point maybe, but in those circumstances it can then explode. Um, so that I think was probably the challenges. Um, I mean, on this last trip, the other muck up was a self-induced 
recovery attempt, we um, we came across one of the one of the guides from Naka Naka driving. You know those big steel boats that they do the Okavango trips in. Yeah, the we'd been stuck there all night, and Miremi this December was beyond muddy and wet. And most of the big holes have got a drive round, but his boat was too wide, so he went through the middle and got very stuck. So we're the first along, and he's kind of obviously pleased to see somebody, and then he says, well, do you have a rope? I mean, there we are in Shackleton, and we are so shiny and new, and we've got all this gear, and obviously we've got a rope. So I just felt this <laughs> obligation that I obviously had to help, and then and then I felt I had to prove myself because I had this fancy car, and now we were going to do this recovery, and then the back of my mind was thinking, oh, we can get some liquor hero shots for Joe, and I just rushed completely into it. And so we get the kinetic strap out. I don't look to see how stuck this bloody vehicle is or what's in it. Or And I'll tell Deb, no, she must signal and take a photo or whatever, but duck behind the tree. Well, just as well, because the bloody rope snapped. <gasps> and it, it felt like a rifle shot. It came all the way back, took out our lights, Thank goodness, you know, Shackles has got that completely solid back, so there's no, yeah. like, glass for, yes. you know, like a normal double cap. I mean, it could have been disastrous. And I keep thinking back on it, and I just think, you know what? You don't need to try and be the hero. I mean, nothing happened, but it could have gone terribly wrong. So what did you learn about yourself and that experience? Uh, you know what? What I, my, my first gut was the poor guy stuck. There's no reception. We just bought, in fact, we bought a satellite phone. We finally um, sh shelled out for that. So we had one. And my first thought was, you know what? We phoned the office in Nakanaka, tell them he's stuck, and someone must come help him. Is what we should have done. What we ended up doing in the end. But I just maybe it was a feeling that we had to prove ourselves or that I had to prove myself. I won't do it again. But I think, um, what, I think what I'm saying is your initial gut and how often do we second guess yeah. our gut when that actually is the loudest voice we need to listen to? I mean, that was the solution. I mean, after we, did, we chatted to the guy after the rope and bust and everything, he then confesses that the cruiser is full of fuel. So he's not even towing a boat. He's got all the fuel that he's been sent to buy in Mound. So there was no way. I mean, it was just too heavy. Gosh. Um, but live and learn, hey? Live the, and learn. The moral of the story is the gut wins over. <laughs> Karen, what have been some of your interesting situations where you and Chris have been tested as a couple have you not gone on long <laughs> enough trips <laughs> no we had a couple of times so i think our uh, we, we did get stuck in, as well in relatively remotely in tanzania in ruaha national park and um there's, there's a swamp there and it did look awfully green um so we should have <laughs> I mean, we kind of had a gut feeling as well. Like, it was a similar story. The gut said, it's too green, go and check it out. But it was like, ah, you know. So we did get ourselves very stuck. We couldn't really dig ourselves out. Um, we did have a ranger with us because we were quite remote. Uh, like I said, then you have to have a ranger in that part of the park that she drive there. But in the end, when we did do a lot of digging. We did buy our max tracks and everything else, but I think it was just too much. So we had a very nice day sitting there and waiting for some of the other rangers to come and rescue us, <laughs> luckily. Yeah. And then it was just a very long ride back to campsite um, yeah. when it got quite late already. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it wasn't so bad. It's just, I guess, maybe the good thing about it was, yeah, you can get help, you can get out and, um, mm -hmm. yeah. If you can't do anything, if you can't dig yourselves out yourselves, you know, don't also at one point you have to stop as well. You can't keep digging, digging and trying, and you just dig the car deeper in eventually. So just um, open a bottle of wine. Yeah, yeah exactly. Just enjoy the view. And, um, but yeah, it was 
it's, and, and I think the other thing is, yeah, I think, you, like you said before, we can always find help and then, um, and you just try and figure it out and yeah, go from there. The next time we got stuck in the sand, we were actually able to reverse ourselves out of it. So, oh, you know, brilliant. we did have a learning there. Yeah, they, they, that's <laughs> experience talks, right? And Tina, yeah. what if, you know, you, you really went into the, 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 the harshest part of Africa on your own miles and days and weeks without seeing people in a confined yeah. space with Anton. How did you go and, and with all the things that you've yeah. spoken about that really tested you, how did you navigate yeah. that as a couple? Did you, were yeah, you so prepared think, for that in any way? I don't think you can be prepared <laughs> because you're finding yourselves in extreme situations which you have a, never probably find yourself before. So you don't know how you're going to react. Right. So this is you have to you have to wing it. Right. Um, and I think when we got into arguments or disagreements, that was mainly when we had um, maybe different expectations or different uh, comfort zones, um, mm -hmm. different limits that because it is when one person is pushed to the limit and the other person maybe isn't and wants to carry on further and then you get into a conflict. So that was our experience where Anton, Anton has no limits, right? He's got no fears. He just, you know, head on um, where I do, I do have fears and I do have limits. And um, I think he sometimes felt hold back and that's when he got frustrated and, um, and I was so far to my limits that, that when we, we you know, ended up in, you know, conflicting situations. Um, and I do think that is, you know, for women traveling in Oberland, you know, you need to find a partner who is, you know, uh, sensitive to everyone's needs and open to listen. And um, we always said, um, you know, whoever has the, the, the lowest threshold, that's what we have to go with. You know, you can't push somebody into, you know, a very scary situation. That isn't just because the other person isn't scared. You know, that doesn't work. So you always have to and have a low threshold for, you know, you know, you know, those safety situations. Um, so so if I have to summarize what all three yeah. of you've said, would you say that personal preparation as in the person that you're traveling with set out your expectations early on? because they may be different and just because you live together doesn't mean yeah. they're the same. And then, because under stress, yeah. that's when we see the best and the worst of each other. But when you are in a confined space where there's nothing and no one around, it can feel quite lonely and adds to the stress because you're not connecting with the person that you're with. Mm. I don't know that you can really sort of realistically lay it out and set the parameters before you set off. I think I think most couples that do this together, and unless they're very new together, pretty much have an idea of each other's relative strengths and weaknesses. So I think so long as you recognize that and then then recognize when there is irritability or anger, that as you were t saying, Tina, it stems from usually fear. Yeah. Because now you're being pushed to do something that you don't feel comfortable doing. Yeah. So I think it's really to recognize that and and also to understand that some people are good at some things and others are good at others. I mean, yeah. for example, Deb can't do borders. I mean, that's what I, I well, it's not my favorite either, but I'm much better at staying calmer and dealing with the bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera. Ditto, she gets quite stressed driving in city traffic, and I'm okay with that. But if I have to deal with changing a SIM card or anything to do with tech or Wi-Fi or that whole department I give to her because it just sets me into an instant rage. So that's really, I think you've got to navigate and let people do the bits they're good at, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And I, I agree, Dan, and I also think what, mm. sorry, Joy, to mm. interrupt you. Um, uh, we also, as a preparation, we, we divided up responsibilities. I think that is, I'm sure you all done that, right? So one person is responsible for the car mechanics, one for 
the cooking, photography, whatever. You have your rules and that helps mm. to set that at the beginning. And I think another um, important thing is, and that's how we navigated through those difficult situations is we are here as a team. Like if we, mm. if we turn against each other, we're not going to make this. Like we were in such rough environments, um, which were sometimes, you know, they were risky. And if you're not working together, you're not going to make it. And, yeah. and even if we were arguing or whatever, we immediately had to pull together again as a team because, you know, we had a common enemy sometimes, right? And it was either the environment or other people or whatever the situation was, we had a common en enemy and we, we were the team we had to pull together. And, and you know what, let's face it, most couple problems, you know, are, are irrelevant mm -hmm. compared to the big yeah. problems you're facing in the world. And especially at overlanding. And I think to your point, Tina, it you learn a lot about yourself and each other under those adverse circumstances, and it can either grow yeah. you stronger or not. Yeah. But if you just yes. if you just yes. set a little bit of a a roadmap of what do you want out of the trip, and if if we're going to get into mm. difficult situations, how are we going to pull together and not pull apart, yeah. and remind each yeah. other not to do that because it's unpredictable. The environment is unpredictable. Yeah. The situation, yeah. you might think it's going to be, and you've all said it, you might be going down the road thinking you've got a plan and then, well, life's got a bigger plan. <laughs> and whatever you thought you had under control is actually not. And and how do you do that so that it doesn't wreck the whole thing? Because I know people who've actually has nearly turned the trip so on its head that one was going to leave. So you want to, but if, and even though, We've lived with people for a long time. We can't assume what's going to tip somebody over the edge because overlanding when you, as you would say, Donna, up and down the tent and you're cooking and it's a fire mm. and you're cleaning and, and all of that, it's work. It's not a holiday <laughs> and can be quite exhausting for yeah, a long we, period of I time. Think also to other women who, who kind of, or maybe listening to this and thinking, oh, God, I don't know if this is for me. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how, Tina and Karen, how you roll on these things, but we we kind of get, we do get to a point where we will take accommodation. Um, you know, it has to be, it's got to work. And mm -hmm. if reasonably priced accommodation is available, absolutely. Yeah. It gives everyone a bit of a break. You could get a chance to clean Clean yes. your, do some laundry, and <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to be all sackcloth. And it's exactly yeah. that. <laughs> it's exactly I agree. that. There's enough, I think there's enough uh, adventure to be on the road. I, I also sometimes don't need additional adventure during the night when I'm trying to recover. <laughs> you know, so I think yeah. uh, there is definitely a balance. I, I agree with you. That's one of the things that Paul and I also agree on, that at least once a week or 10 days, there's a solid roof over our head, proper running water, cleaning, washing, somebody else cooking the meal, because it just helps you catch your breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I agree. So in closing, what advice or encouragement would you give someone who's never been overlanding and has listened to this conversation? How would you encourage them to just give it a go? Oh, just start, you know, <laughs> just make a move in, and forget about the vehicle, whatever vehicle you've got, just give it a go. And I, I, I think yeah. most people can endure, endure more than they think they can, and they're capable of more than they think they can. I never thought I'm going to finish the trip at the beginning. I thought, wow. yeah, I'm going to try how far I'm going to get. Um, but actually, you know, the human race is quite sturdy, and, and, you know, most people can really, you know, master overlanding much better than they initially um anticipated Karen? and you know what it is yes. it, 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 your comfort zone grows like you know you started with the comfort zone which is like that big 
And after a couple of weeks, your comfort zone is suddenly that big. And that is that is amazing, right? And you still feel comfortable then at just a bigger space suddenly. So it's, it's, it's great. But isn't that the uh, whole you thing? Get, you get braver as you go along. Yes. Yes. It's true. And I guess you always think you should plan everything. We were saying already about planning. Yes, you should have an idea, but you're never going to be fully prepared. So at one point, you just have to go and you just do it. And like with most things in life, I guess, as well. It's some point you just go. And if you're already thinking about it, then obviously there's a spark there that wants you to do it. So And maybe try it somewhere where it's a bit easier. I mean, maybe don't try. Well, although I guess... You know, you just went in the deep end straight away. So <laughs> that also works, obviously. <laughs> and I think to find the humor, because there is humor, even in some of the mistakes and the sticky bits, there's always humor. And it doesn't, life doesn't have to be always that serious. Uh, I agree with you, Jo. I mean, and, and just not take yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. and, and, and make it make it your own. Like, There's no 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 written rule how overlanding has to be. Like like Dana said, like you don't have to rough it for every single day and sleep, you know, without a pillow, right? Or you know, if you want to have your whatever hot chocolate glass of wine every night, have it. You know, make it as comfortable as you want it. There's no rule, right? You and then and then you you create your own perfect trip. There is you know it needs to suit you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Tina, you and Anton have got a, a little man in your life. And yes. he's, he's going on his first long trip, I guess, to Botswana. So that's going to bring a whole new dynamic wow. into the mix. Yeah, we've done a couple of road trips with him. As you know, we traveled when he was only a couple of months old. We took three months to travel from Mexico City all the way up to Alaska. But that was with creature comfort around. But I mean... With a you know four or five month old baby, you can't have enough creature comforts, I guess. <laughs> um, so, so he is pretty good. We also traveled with him up to Zimbabwe, uh, but that was only in the car. But that was a road trip, and he was like four month old, I think. So we've done a lot of traveling. So he's okay in the car, um, but we've done traveling around South Africa now in the last two years and camping, and he absolutely loves it. And it's is very excited, and obviously he's allowed to drive the car on the, you know, off the beat track roads. And um, he uh, helped us the other day to get the car. We got stuck on a beach in the sand and he loved helping us dig the car out. And, you know, he's mm -hmm. like an expert, obviously. <laughs> um, so we have a five-year-old yeah, overlander. Pardon? We have a five-year-old overlander. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely doesn't have any fears, I tell you that. <laughs> and um, oh. like Dana, we would actually also like to do you know, a trip from Cape Town, you know, back to the UK. Mm. It kind of marks a 10-year anniversary almost. <laughs> um, and we would be hoping to go up the East Coast. Um, mm. But I'm not sure about the political situations at the moment in the Middle East. No, it's looking, it's not looking great. Eh? Yeah, so I think that's holding us back. But that would be great to do with Finn as well. We would love to take our son on an overland trip. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't matter. The age, they're great. They can, you know... Resilient. They can cope with all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, sorry, Joe, I've got one more thing I wanted maybe to mention because you talked about, you know, um, to get more women into the overlanding and often women get like, you know, you know, just, you know, tag along, you know, to their partners, maybe partners who think this is their lifelong dream, what they want to do. And I think, so my my message or my my, you know, kind of, suggestion is to you know make it your own like you need to grab this journey by the horns and make it your journey and uh, dive into a domain which might not be necessarily female if that actually still exists in the 21st century sorry yeah um and and do something to to be involved in so i, I for example took over the role as a mechanic so You know, I, I had sessions with Paul and his colleagues to get trained by all the mechanics to, to, to know which part is what, what does that sound make, you know, how to change certain things, daily checks. That was my responsibility. And, and um, you know, that, that you get respect on the road when, when suddenly you go to a garage and say, oh, we need a you know, oil filter, 
needs to be changed, you know, and then the mechanics immediately turn to the men and start talking and Anna just said, it's not my it's not my domain talk to her right and then the guys they were like what like oh this is so weird you know but you get respect you earn respect by just making something your own grab it don't be afraid and say oh because women can't deal with cars uh, don't step back and it, opposite step into it learn about it and that's preparation you can easily do you know at home and then you're confident and then you earn your respect and then then you make it your own. It's your mission, right? And I think that's how women could, you know, could start, play a bigger role in overlanding. And and it's not just the mechanics. I mean, not everyone wants to do that, but find something you like. Like if language is your thing, then if you best travel to West Africa, you become an expert in French, right? Make that your mission or local cuisine, you know, try and find the best recipes in every country you go to, make that your mission, you know, write it down or whatever, or, you know, like make a cookbook out of it, whatever you want to do, but you must find something which makes that trip your trip and not, you're not just a tag along. I love it. Uh, Karen, you're like mm. that because you've, you're a foodie, so <laughs> you, you could start your own overlanding cookbook. Yes, so we keep trying to figure out how to make easy meals and that's the, you know, Interesting and um, yeah, but, that, but that's one of the things that people do. You know, they have concerns about what food's going to be available and what will I be able to cook and mm -hmm. and and simple meals. But Tina, what you said is it is a team effort. If you're traveling with someone, get involved. What are your strengths? Yeah. And and uh, Donnie, you said the same thing. Play to your strengths and and yes. and, and make it a team thing. And it's not my job is my job and your job is your and the cross functionality of it is it's also part of growing yourself and growing a set of skills and and empowering yes. yourself so that you don't feel trapped yes. so to speak mm -hmm. and and disempower we we disempower ourselves by saying i can't do something step into Correct. the fear and and the mind made limitations and and you're more than what you think you are and you can do more than you think you can Absolutely. So let's hope we are going to grow the the women in overlanding community through your inspiration. And I really appreciate you taking up your evening to to come together and inspire others yes, through you. your experiences. And hopefully there's a, a nice little network that's going to build with the three of you. Yeah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Without the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a Zoom glass of wine together. Absolutely. Super. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much, Donna. Thank you so much, Tina and Karen. I really, really appreciate it. And we'll see you. It was a pleasure. Well, Tina, pleasure. I'll see you first because Thank you're in Cape Town. You. Karen in June and Donna somewhere along the way. Somewhere, yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. We'll see Thank you. you. Thanks okay. so much. Good evening. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Hopefully you enjoyed this as much as I did. And I really hope that this will carry on the flag that these ladies have flown and inspire many more women in overlanding. If you like what we do, please like and subscribe. And if you can, we'd love you to support us through Patreon.